Welcome back to the next uh, session. Uh, in this uh, class, uh, I will be talking about uh, the arguments of Sigmund Bowman, a very important uh, sociologist and a chapter titled uh, Sociology What For? Uh, it is basically the introduction of his book titled Thinking uh, Sociologically. And uh, this book as well is being widely used across the globe to introduce uh, sociology. It uh, provides a very fascinating introduction to the subject, very, very, I, I personally found it very uh, interesting. So, the title of the chapter is Sociology What For? It very uh, precisely tells what is the kind of uniqueness of sociological uh, perspective. So, he, it is a very simple chapter, extremely simple chapter compared to the writings of C. Wright Mills or uh, Peter Berger. So, he uh, basically starts off with this uh, question, what is the difference that makes sociology different from other social sciences? We know that uh, social sciences in general deal with the social aspect, uh, the, the, the society and sociology in particular is looking at the society as a, uh, as a separate entity. So, the question is what is the difference that makes sociology different from uh, other social sciences like uh, economics or political science uh, or uh, you know other similar kind of social science disciplines. So, he argues that the habit of viewing human actions as elements of wider figurations that is of known random assembly of actors locked together in a web of mutual dependency. And this is an extremely important uh, uh, point when he talks about the and in, a, an, another, in another word, this is the crux of uh, sociological perspective. The ability uh, to or the habit or the ability of, hum, of viewing human action as elements of wider figurations. That is of a known random assembly of actors locked together in a web of mutual dependency. So, there are two uh, key terms in this uh, section. One is this elements of wider figuration and second one is mutual dependency. And what do these terms mean? What do, what does it mean when we say that uh, we have to view human actions as elements of wider figurations? It simply means that a person's action cannot be understood by looking at that, those actions alone. They make sense only when you understand those actions in the larger context. Most often, even while people attribute their own motives into their own actions, even while when we, when we all would like to uh, say that somebody has done that and uh, he is, he alone is responsible, of course, he would be responsible to, to a large extent, but a sociological perspective would really, uh, would compel you to look at his action not as an isolated individual, not as an individual act, but as an element of wider figuration. That is of a known random assembly of actors locked together in a web of mutual dependency. This web of mutual dependency is, is something that is, that is a defining character of, uh, of a society. We are all entangled in this web of mutual dependency. Our actions make sense, we are able to act in a particular manner only because there is a, there is a thick uh, you know, layers of, 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 of social interactions uh, which provide a kind of a mutual dependency. Our actions make sense only when, uh, it, it, when, when others uh, reciprocate with that. We are able to act in a society only when it is understood and reciprocated by others. Otherwise, we will be acting in isolation without it being intelligible to others. So, this particular uh, capacity of looking at human interaction, its patterns, its uh, very specific forms of mutual dependency is what Bowman argues is the very, very specific, very uh, essential feature of uh, sociological uh, thinking. And he says that sociology is basically a way of thinking about society. And this point we have come across earlier as well. Uh, C. Wright uh, Mills as well says that, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, sociological perspective that we uh, try to develop is not something, is, is we are not trying to uh, understand something that is not being studied by others. 
It's not an exclusive property of social scientists, but it is a particular unique way of looking at it, developing a particular type of consciousness. It's a particular developing a particular ability to look at uh, things from a very specific vantage point, from a from a very disciplinary vantage point, and that is what he's saying. It's a way of thinking about society, and sociology as a discipline helps you to develop this particular way of thinking so that you understand what is sociological perspective and the theoretical foundations and the methodological orientations of the discipline helps you to develop this particular way of thinking about society about our own life about the life of the people around us and let us see how bowman uh, explains this very interestingly bowman begins the essay bowman continues with the essay by making a distinction between sociology and common sense it's a very i i thought that it's a very uh, interesting take because sociology has a particular or a peculiar relationship uh, this term common sense now what is common sense uh, you know common sense again has different meanings in different uh, context uh, we would usually we would say that somebody uh, doesn't have common sense so we mean to say that that person doesn't act properly or he doesn't behave properly or he doesn't understand uh, things properly but in uh, sociology or in anthropology common sense is usually defined as the sum total of knowledge that people uh, acquire the kind of knowledge that people acquire which enable them to live in a society uh, in a normal manner or people who are able to live normally in their everyday life uh this living is possible because that person has acquired quite a lot of knowledge about how to lead normally or how to live normally in a society how to act how to dress how to behave how to speak how to eat what to eat what not to eat uh, how to behave in specific in in specific uh, situations so a, a person's normal life becomes possible only when they acquire this set of knowledge in other ways we understand it as common sense and uh, sociologists will tell you that uh, the process of socialization plays a very important role in uh, instilling this common sense uh, to the minds of the people so generally uh, every person of sound mind must be having uh, a huge amount of common sense which allows him to uh, live in the society so he knows about uh, Uh, his life his society the major institutions the important customs the rituals about religion about family about everything so so then why that it has a peculiar relationship sociologists would argue that the subject matter of sociology is also something very similar to the subject matter of common sense in other words sociology studies a host of themes and subjects that are already in the realm of common sense of the people and this is a very peculiar situation now compare this situation with that of a uh, for example an astronomer or a or a, or a physicist or a scientist who is working in, in in the field of microbiology you know their subject matter the scientific terms uh, used in microbiology or physics or nanotechnology or nuclear physics these are not a part of the common sense of ordinary people okay they have a complete they are in a completely separate very limited uh, scientific realm but on the other hand the subject matter of sociology is something that is very much in the common sense of ordinary people the subject matter what does sociology study sociology studies all the it studies the society it studies the social institutions it studies the social organization it studies uh, you know institutions like family marriage kinship religion it studies development it studies uh, culture so it studies society in which an ordinary person lives so in other words every ordinary human beings already possess quite a lot of knowledge about the subject matter of sociology so to a large extent people have certain amount of knowledge about the society in which they live otherwise their life becomes impossible they won't be able to live properly so sociology is entering into this uh, field which is already been uh, understood and there is already a body of knowledge which is uh, understood by people and then offering that okay you know a lot of things about your society but here we come and we have better explanations for that 
and that is slightly challenging task. It is a very interesting uh, uh, challenge, it is a very very uh, you know fascinating question to tell people that of course you understand about your own society, but we have better explanations for that and that is the promise of sociology that is what sociological consciousness mean something offering something extra offering something more insightful than what is usually understood by the uh, ordinary common people. And uh, Bowman talks about four very important points that uh, distinguish sociology from that of common sense and these four points are very very important. One he says it sociology ensures or sociology uh, you know sociology compels that you speak responsibly. It insists on the rule of responsible speech and this is very interesting. You know in our uh, ordinary conversations we make lot of very sweeping statements about incidents, about particular communities, about particular group of people, about a uh, lot of events. We in, in other words we tend to speak very loose like in, in a very loose language. But Bowman says that while you are living as a member of a society that is fine, but you cannot do that within sociology. You have to speak responsibly. You are you must be able to stand by your statement, you, uh, you, you must be able to substantiate why that you are making such a statement, it has to be very very careful. He says that it is very easy to make very sweeping statements, very generalized statement very you know uh, stereotypical statements, we, we hear it quite often about communities, about other uh, religions, about other caste, about other gender, about other uh, countries. We make quite a lot of very very uh, simplistic, very generalized statements and uh, Bowman says that that is not possible. If you are acting as a professional because sociologist is supposed to be a professional, if you are acting and behaving as a professional you must speak responsibly. And where does this responsibility come from? It comes from your peer review. If you are saying something as uh, a product of sociological research, then you must submit it uh, to be scrutinized by your fellow sociologists, something called as a peer review. And this is something very very essential aspects of every science. You cannot say that okay, I have a theory and uh, nobody should question that. Or you cannot say that I, I have an argument or I have a point about this particular incident and none of you are uh, allowed to question that. That is not the spirit of uh, sociology. A sociologist will be always ready to present herself or present her or his uh, argument for, for wider scrutiny from uh, her professional community and only through a kind of a critical appraisal. A, an argument about a society becomes accepted. So this is one of the first points that Bowman uh, talks about. It. Second one is the size of the field uh, from which materials for judgments are drawn. This is again a very very fascinating uh, area and, and very closely connected with how common sense is made and, and how people speak uh, from their common sense. So if you ask people why are you saying so? about a particular incident or about a particular community or about a particular group of people. One of their very often experience or argument is that I felt so, it happened to me, I experienced that or my father told me or my brother experienced that or somebody said me this. Of course all these ideas are true, all these arguments are valid, their experience could be true, they must have experienced that. Their, their father must have told, their uncle must have told or somebody else in their community must have told. But for a sociological argument this is not sufficient. While your own personal experience is valid, it is not sufficient. You need to have a much larger size of the field. You need to have a much, if, especially if you are doing research on certain things, you have to have a larger field from where you draw your conclusions, you draw from them, you draw the materials and you draw these materials and you analyze them properly and only after that you come to a certain kind of a conclusion. 
your hearsay, your family's experience, your individual experience, the, the kind of incident that happened uh, in something, something that you read in newspaper. All these things could be valid, but only up to a point. And unless these experiences are subjected to scientific scrutiny, and here you must be by now understood that this, this point is about the kind of a scientific methodology the kind of a scientific methodology that sociology insists on. You need to have a rigorous methodology in order to put out your, uh, in, order to, in order to present your argument. Your argument cannot be based on your own experience. And you know, uh, of late, in the recent times, this, this particular point has been criticized very, 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 very strongly on, on the, in the light of a lot of theoretical, uh, new theoretical developments about uh, autobi how autobiographies are important, how the narration of a particular person is important. But I am not going into that. But in general, sociology, which emerged as a modern social science, insists that its scientific methodology is something important. It cannot be reduced to the story of individual experience or the hearsay or the kind of a stories that you hear about that. And the third one is the most fascinating one. It is about how you make sense of this particular world. And he very brilliantly put it to see the social in the individual and the general in the particular. So, what does it mean? How does uh, you see the social in the individual and the general in the particular? So, a sociologist would argue that an individual quite often represents the social. How much ever an individual try to be unique, separate, uh, quite independent, quite different, he represents or he mirrors or he reflects quite a lot of uh, very, very important aspects of the society, every individual for that matter. You can take your own case, your, your own example. For example, uh, myself, I represent, I, while I am an individual, I represent the society. In my look, I uh, represent the society, I dress up like a man, my haircut uh, is that of a man, I behave uh, quite often accordingly in terms of how a man should behave. So, an individual quite often represents the kind of a social and in order to understand that is something very, very important. So, that is why again it brings back to the point that why people behave in certain manner. So, instead of uh, you know accusing them or instead of finding fault them or instead of uh, you know uh, saying that okay that person is responsible instead of putting all responsibility and agency to that particular person. It would be more insightful if we say that he represents a larger trend. He represents a larger, broader pattern of the society. And that offers very interesting insights. In, 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 uh, I can give you quite a lot of examples. You all must be knowing that the teachers, the, especially the school teachers of the previous years, they very strongly believed that uh, uh, you know, physical punishment, beating up the, the, the children or corporal punishment is something very essential aspects of teaching. And uh, I have uh, quite a lot of memories about uh, some of the teachers who uh, used to beat up students very, very uh, harshly. And on the one hand, you can say that they were very cruel people and you can say that these people have to be blamed. But on the other hand, the teachers of that generation really believed that a teacher has to really uh, he has to be feared by the children and, and the children have to be physically punished or only through this physical punishment that the children will learn certain things. And that was a kind of a common understanding that made them to beat up children, small children with uh, sticks and then resort to all other kind of uh, punishment. So here we are understanding why certain people behave in certain certain manner. And keep in mind, I am not attaching any moral uh, meanings with that. I am not saying it is good or bad, but I am only saying that uh, why certain people behave in certain, certain, certain way or certain manner has to be understood in a larger context. Because quite often, they are representing certain streaks, certain, certain, certain aspects of the society. So is the case with the general and the particular, a, a, an, an incident, a communal riot or a caste conflict or a honor killing or a dowry death, n number of examples, these examples 
they really reflect the kind of a larger trends. They reflect the kind of a larger processes taking place. So, this is something very, very, this is an extremely important insight that Bowman wants us to develop as a part of developing sociological perspective. Then he also says it is about how our individual biographies intertwine with the history that we share with our fellow human beings. I hope by now this point is very clear that if you have to understand your own biography, your own life so far, the, the, the story of your own community, you have to look at it with the history that we share with our fellow human beings. And this fellow human beings could be the people immediately around you, it could be your community, it could be the people who speak your language, your state, your country and maybe the, the, the civilization or at, a, or at a given point in time. So, it's a, it, it would be a very fascinating experience for you uh, to write a biography of your own and trying to see how your uh, social aspects like your caste or your class or your gender or your economic position, it, how these factors really shaped your life so far. And definitely this particular attempt will discount your individual effort. And that is what the, 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 the crux of the sociological argument. Of course, your individual effort, your individual uh, intelligence, your individual motivation, these things are important. It, they, we are not, uh, sociologists are not discounting that. But they have to be placed in the larger context. Then you will realize that why we are thinking in a particular way. And the way in which we are thinking is often the product of our own society. How much ever we try to be distinct or even our notion of how what constitutes difference, how we can be different, how we can look differently, how we can act differently and even this, this thinking is shaped or it, they are constrained by the society. So, it, it actually uh, provides a very, very fascinating idea about how people can live, how people uh, live in their own society. Then the fourth point, a very uh, important point again is that sociology defamiliarizes the familiar. It very consciously make you to defamiliarize the familiar and it makes you more sensitive. You know, what is defamiliarization? He again gives a very interesting uh, statement. Familiarity is the staunchest enemy of inquisitiveness and criticism. It is a very, very important uh, uh, statement. Familiarity is the staunchest enemy of inquisitiveness and criticism. Some things you get habituated to, some things you get become so familiar, then you will lose the ability to find uh, how it works. We become so accustomed to that. We will not find anything interesting in that. Take the case of our own family. You know, we are born into a family, we are, uh, we, we grow up, we grew up in that particular family, we live our everyday life in that particular family. So, each and every aspect of that family life is so familiar to us and that to a large extent will prevent you from developing a critical viewpoint about how this particular family function. And the best example could be about this uh, gender roles, who does what kind of work and what and how gender plays out in this family sphere. We all think that the very act that the, your, your, our mother get up early morning and she prepares breakfast and serves it to the to, to your father and, and other members of the family, father goes to work, mother stays back at home and we consider it as quite natural, quite normal and we consider it as natural and, and this term is very problematic. We think that it is natural, it is normal and we fail to understand that there is nothing natural about it, there is nothing normal about it. You can, live, you can live differently, there is nothing wrong if father gets up early morning and does all this household work, if mother goes out for work and then come back in the evening, father takes care of the children, people can live, people live like that. Okay? But we are not able to think about these possibilities because we are so familiar, we are so habituated with the way we live. So, sociology very consciously, very consciously uh, ask you uh, to defamiliarize from the familiar, so that this uh, inquisitiveness and criticism can develop about even some of the most intimate places. It can, it can develop about the most familiar places. 
So, that is why he says it has an anti fixating power. Once you understand sociology properly, you uh, will try hard or it will naturally come to you not to get fixated with a particular idea, fixated with or get convinced very easily, get fixated with a particular argument or a particular, particular ideology. You will this, this, this element of skepticism as many scholars whom we discussed earlier have mentioned, the, the, the tendency to look beyond, the tendency to look through the facade of social structure, it will keep coming back so that you will not be convinced about that okay this is normal but of course you will realize that this is how people live they are these are their preferences and of course it then it becomes your uh, personal uh, obligation or it becomes your personal choice to agree with that or not to agree with that and that is why bowman says it has a very big destabilizing effect on the existing power relations it has a very strong destabilizing effect the moment you uh, think about family in this manner that I just explained uh, to, uh, to critically look at the gender and the, the, the work that people do, there are certain, certain feminine duties in, in the home, there are certain manly duties in the home or in the workplace or in the public sphere and if you begin to question all of them, then what is essentially would be happening is that we are destabilizing the, the kind of a conventional family structure. And whether one needs to do that or not is becomes an individual choice. But you realize that, okay, this is a possibility that uh, the way in for or, or uh, another example, uh, a, a classroom. Take the example of a classroom. If the teacher comes, the teacher uh, in a very dictatorial manner speaks. He he gives a monologue and he goes back. And uh, if you think that that is the normal way of functioning in a classroom, you are very very uh, badly mistaken. There is one particular way of doing that. There is nothing natural about it. There is nothing normal about it. Rather, you can really rework with the teacher if he or she is willing to make that classroom situation much more lively, much more, much more interactive and much more engaging. So, this opens up quite a lot of possibilities. So, this destabilizing effect, Bowman says that it makes people almost a kind of a perpetual skeptic, uh, a, a, a person who is will be very difficult to get convinced of by by certain thing whether it is the arguments of religion whether the arguments about nationalism if people say that okay this is the way in which you have to uh, feel nationalism you might not feel so if people say that okay this is how you are supposed to express your religiosity or this is what spirituality means this is what religion means you might not agree so this has a very strong destabilizing effect on the existing power relations and quite often you can find yourself uh, in, 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 in a difficult situation because if you earnestly follow this sociological perspective, you can uh, get into uh, difficult situations. And that finally, uh, Bowman talks about, he has a very beautiful chapter also about this freedom and dependence, how uh, people experience freedom and how people are dependent. So, sociological perspective in general provides a very, very interesting and fascinating insights about uh, our own notion of freedom, how are we living and what are the kind of boundaries of our life, are there alternative ways in which we can live our life differently, how independent we are, how dependent we are, how unfree we are, okay. can we think of living life in a more meaningful manner without much uh, you know worrying about, about the society. Now, once we understand society as a construct which evolved over a period of time in a given context, then it also enables you to think whether can you live differently in a more meaningful manner, how much ever, how, however way you define it. So, that provides very interesting and fascinating ideas about your notion of freedom and dependence. Of course, while sociology asks you or sociology emphasizes or tells you that you are dependent on others, it does not mean that you are all the time have to live according uh, to the dictates put forward by the society, whether it is by the tradition, by the religion or by various other institutional aspects. It, it provides you quite a lot of opportunities to explore your own life uh, with the kind of media, uh, with the kind of meanings and ideology that you attach uh, to, to the values that you attach yourself. So, it opens up huge possibilities for exploring ideas of freedom and to and to uh, think about dependence and independence in a different way. 
So we are summing up the discussions about uh, uh, sociological perspective. We uh, touched upon three important uh, scholars, uh, Sigmund Bauman whom we discussed today, Peter Berger and um, C. Wright Mills. Uh, as I told you, widely considered as uh, important scholars across the globe. So it essentially tells you that this is a form of a consciousness, this is a form of a particular ability to think about society, ability to uh, understand our own life in the larger canvas of uh, human uh, history. I hope that uh, this uh, helped you to uh, develop a deeper understanding about sociological perspective which will definitely help you to appreciate the discipline, its theory and the uh, subsequent sections of this course. Uh, let us find up. Uh, thank you.